Hello guys, it's Christmas time, it's New Year's time and it's time for something special. We're about to get 25,000 subscribers. For most of you, you keep sending me messages and telling me it's nothing, you're underestimated. Okay, I'm happy and I'm fairly satisfied with my audience. Thanks for watching and hope you're going to enjoy in years to come. I'm about to make uh, one of the most popular videos, the one that you like the most. It's going to be step-by-step -step Dragon Opening. Dragon has been my favorite opening for all these years. Dragon was the first opening that I chose when I was a kid, when I started to play chess. And I started to play chess at the age of 12. So for more than 30 years, I've been playing Dragon and I believe that I have pretty good experience and to be honest with you, I have amazing results with it. I'm just going to give you uh, one example. When I play my games online and when I lose some rating and when I feel like something goes wrong, I just started to play Dragon to get my points back. So that's how I actually believed that opening and how much I like it. We're going to divide it into the two chapters this is going to be the dragon about the sidelines and there is going to be another one about the main lines but I just wanted to tell you one thing before we immediately go and get straight to the work um, you guys all know for example main lines Yugoslav variation long castle and these most common things you don't pay too much attention on the sidelines in this video you you will you'll be able to learn something about the sidelines it is not going to go deep into these variations and that's why i usually say stay by step by step videos are good for medium level players for lower rated players who know nothing about the opening to get like at least basic ideas to learn the basic tricks and to learn like uh first few steps about one opening and believe me while i was making and reviewing all these lines to make this video because now I gotta be too ser very serious because so many good players even watch these videos. Uh, this video is even good for good players because I found so many novelties and even it came like a good refreshment for me. Don't forget I'm an IM and I believe it's a pretty uh, a good level. So let's get started and today I'm just going to teach you sidelines in the dragon step by step. Once again, it's my choice of the lines. I believe with experience of 30, over 30 years, more than thousands and thousands of games uh, working with all these students, I believe this is going to be a very, very complete video about the dragon. Let's get, let's go. So after like e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, g6. We have the dragon so since in the next video i'm going to explain you all the main lines uh, in this video i'm just going to explain you the sidelines and sidelines are uh, bishop e2 uh, which has like a pretty big amount of uh, variations in it uh, then apart from bishop e2 we have knight d5 we have h4 uh, then we have bishop b5 check then we have h3 uh, then bishop g5 after that 11 fish variation used in uh, Netflix series Queen's Gambit and then Fianchet aligned with g3 I'm going to even mention one thing about bishop e 3 because in many of these lines that sidelines that we're going to cover today uh, they're going to be transpositions into the lines that can be part of the sidelines and of this first video so even though uh, the whole video next video is going to be about the main lines with bishop e3 after bishop g7 those who play h3 they transpose into the sixth move h3 and it is going to be a chapter and the part of today's video so let's get started we have no time for waste and let's go with probably one of the worst 
but one of the trickiest sixth move uh, by Balak. So d5. It's a very interesting one. Uh, looks like definitely a waste of time by White, uh, but it blitz. It can it can have like uh, it's interesting, you know, like uh, points. So first of all, knight d5 is very interesting. Uh, they just offer you to grab the pawn on e4 for nothing. And if you fall for that, so I'm not only going to show you how do you play or how should you play these lines, but also what not to do in order not to lose your games. I saw a game bet uh, between two guys like 20 years ago and the guy captured an e4. They were just playing, you know, like table next to me. And uh, I was like, what the hell is this? The guy just jumped on d5. Another guy captured on e4, but it looks kind of risky. No, it's not risky. It's losing for black. After knight b5, threatens knight c7. Knight a6, queen d4, threatens knight. Knight f6 and queen c3. What a lovely way uh, to win the game. Uh, you can't stop knight c7. And at the same time, your rook on a8 is hanging. Uh, so that's why uh, knight d5 can only be assessed as the variation based on very cheap trick by white. And the only thing that you have to remember, don't take on e4. I can give you uh, two alternatives. Uh, to play bishop g7, which is fine. And according to Tivyakov, it's the best move. So after knight f6, bishop f6, those who try to play bishop h6 and send you a message you can't castle, you should be able to go with queen b6, threaten the knight on d4 and pawn on b2, and go for a pretty much winning game. After bishop b5, knight d7, I'm showing you Tivyakov's game, and looks like they have a certain uh, amount of compensation here. Tivyakov against Smith, back to 2001, didn't take on a2, I don't know why. Because when you take on a2, you can you grab a pawn, you grab a second pawn, you just want to go back to a5 and want to get back into the game to either c7 and d8, and black should be winning. Another option after knight d5 is to take on d5, play queen a5, and to grab the pawn here. I absolutely believe that those who go for this, they will be ready to go with bishop e2 because they already sacked the pawn. So they want to, and they're willing, or they should be willing to sack another pawn to go for some sort of initiative and play queen e2. After bishop g7, bishop g5, watch out, they threaten mate. So just play castle, you're up to pawns, you're ready to get the one pawn back. Although they have lots of problems with a broken pawn structure, uh, exposed king on e1, and black should be a lot better, or at least black has a decent initiative. That's all about move such as knight d5. So it's time for the next one. h4. Playing such a move in the early stage of the game, uh, it clearly shows a willingness of your opponent to go for something crazy, something unusual. But at the same time, don't underestimate h4 moves simply because when they play h4, uh, they announce not only a crazy game, but they also want to sack upon an h4 by playing h5. And it's not to be underestimated because I always uh, teach my students when you play against the g6 type of games, such as Dragon, Kings Indian, Pirates, uh, never hesitate to sack upon on, on h4 and play h5 in order uh, for the sake of open h file and activity along the h file because you would like to attack. And because of that, uh, my uh, vote here goes to two moves, bishop g7 and knight c6. But I'd like to remind you once again of the fact that when they give up a pawn on h4 and push it up to h5, uh, we can call it like a pretty decent and pretty typical uh, sacrifice uh, by white. So after h4, um, I would play bishop g7 or knight c6 because... I'm willing to grab that pawn and to uh, take that pawn. Uh, so uh, here you can play bishop g7 or knight c6. If you play knight c6 first, they can never play a bishop e3 because of knight g4. Uh, they can never play bishop c4 because what the hell is this pawn on h4 doing right now? 
but from another point of view if they play h5 you should uh, you know like uh, grab it without any problems and after like d4 now you can go back and they will play f3 keep in mind they didn't give up a pawn on h4 just like just like that actually uh, they they've just opened up the h file so it's good so you cannot make short castle any longer they already have f3 and g4 being played which means that they kind of launch the attack on the king side and it's pretty difficult to carry on with this type of the game uh, especially considering the fact that we can't castle now it's a problem for our king and for its safety afterwards uh, okay that's why uh, if you decide to play knight c6 h5 knight h5 g4 you should take on d4 first after queen d4 bishop g7 if they move the if they move the queen but where should they move the queen they can only move the queen to d1 now you can play knight f6 they can play f3 but now it's a little bit different there are no knights on c6 and d4 which gives you an easier uh, game and play h5 when you play h5 and force them to take uh, you're going to be absolutely fine because you're about to trade off pieces and they don't have attack anymore when they play g5 i'm willing to play this type of the game but now they don't have the attack as long as they push the pawn up to g5 attack does not exist and because of that uh, i'm absolutely fine with this type of the game so in uh, famous game between watson and valimirovic was bishop e5 bishop d7 and queen d5 this guy played knight f6 this guy uh, went for uh, queen b7 and after a short castle black would be absolutely fine what kind of game is this a broken bone structure kind of exposed uh, king on e1 uh, undeveloped pieces uh, on the back rank all these things favor black in that famous game that i mentioned between watson and vladimirovich after knight d4 was a g takes vladimirovich brought the knight back h takes f takes and this guy played bishop h6 nothing you're just playing a normal game where you're up upon Belimirovic captured play queen b6 um, and obviously this guy has a couple of weaknesses i mainly consider b2 and f2 weak and after queen d2 bishop g4 without castle with threatening knight d4 and knight f3 idea going for the fork and after like bishop h3 knight e5 threatening there rook h3 he could have gone for a castle or he maybe went for that and Velimirovic lost this game against watson back to 1986. Uh, although if you find uh, this approach with knight c6 a little bit weird you can or you just play a bullet you and you've you've just removed like bishop g7 don't worry it's nothing to worry about still the, uh, any bishop in three you, you can play knight g4 for example but watch out when you play knight g4 don't you ever 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 play bishop d7 because they're going to grab the knight on g4 so you just have to play king f8 and uh, we absolutely uh, have one crazy position because not bishop is hanging for example i played a couple of games like this with the queen on f3 um uh, and white has some sort of initiative here so i'm more willing when they play bishop e3 to keep on developing myself with the moves such as knight c6 than to go with a risky knight g4 um, although most of these guys who play h4 they just sack a pawn on h5 you just grab it that's the point and now look at this they can play g4 they cannot play g4 because we just capture and when they capture we we take on d4 they gotta go with bishop e3 we go knight c6 they go queen d2 we go knight f6 to go now knight g4 and when they play f3 uh, now we're about to see the whole point of this variation for black and i believe because of the next move our position has to be considered to be fine for black it's move h5 uh, this is the point the guy is about uh, to go with a long castle he can't play g4 any longer especially considering the fact that the rook on h8 is defended by the bishop on g7 and you just want to go with a typical dragon plan bishop d7 rook c8 knight e5 at the same time you don't want to make short castle because they can break you with 
g4 and bishop h6 but you want to play artificial castle with the king f6 and king g8 in case rook goes for example into the center rook h to e1 you instantly go with the king on h7 and make artificial castle yourself that's the way to play so this h5 h5 is a critical idea uh, grabbing the pawn is something that we shouldn't ever avoid we're up a pawn and after just like you see knight c6 knight f6 and h5 black is doing fine another thing apart from this move h4 is aligned with the bishop b5 that move is usually done by weaker guys or those who don't know theory uh, it's quite a logical and i'd say playable move especially by those who would like to avoid theory sometimes uh, don't pay attention on this type of move just play bishop d7 so when they take my vote goes to not knight bd7 which is absolutely fine of course but queen d7 knight c6 and bishop g7 i would say roughly equal game black is without any troubles but if you like you can also go with knight bd7 and after castles to go bishop g7 absolutely fine position plays the rook on c8 knight goes on c5 or more likely on e5 and you just have a nice game as well then we just have to check move h3 h3 for the first time in today's step-by-step -step video we're about to see one very critical line with h3 h3 has many points first of all h3 secures the bishop on e3 once it gets there so you can't play knight g4 second point behind h3 is that they want to go uh, with g4 in which case uh, they just want to expand on the king side when i was younger i saw one game played between two gms a guy with a white pieces went for h3 and g4 and somehow got a good control of the center and won the game then i applied that in my game as well and won a very convincing game against one of my uh, childhood idols and a pretty good dragon player and pretty good player in uh, overall so h3 should not once again be underestimated and the main point usually goes with securing the bishop on e3 uh, so black cannot go with any knight g4 later let's go uh, you just go in this position with bishop g7 after you play bishop g7 they just go with bishop c4 or g4 those who play bishop c4 it's the main line and we're going to discuss about these lines but let me just show you what happens when they play h3 and g4 first of all i have to tell you that i consider these pawns on h3 and g4 being a little bit weak uh, looks like they've just exposed themselves this pawn structure is weak and it's not that attacking mainly those who play h3 g4 even though it looks like they just want to come up with some sort of attack uh, it's not that dangerous and when they play with h3 and g4 they just want to get some sort of like space advantage let's go we go knight c6 an idea by early knight c6 not castle is to take on d4 if they give us a chance to do it because of this it reminds me of the fianchetta line that is going to be uh, i don't know uh, here uh, showed in like 10 minutes and you will pretty much see that the absolutely the same ideas that we apply in fear and shadow line we're, we're actually applying in this h3 g4 an idea is knight, knight to take on d4 and that actually shows that if they play bishop g2 you just take on d4 play castle and it's a better version of fear and shadow since h3 and g pawns um, are quite exposed and he even threatens to take knight g4 with tempo also uh, I see lots of potential and future weaknesses in White's game because of these two pawns. Also, when they make short castle, it is going to be pretty unsafe. So I quite enjoy this game for Black. Uh, if they, for example, play Knight B3, not allowing you to play Knight D4, you play castles Bishop G2, and there is a special type of uh, type of move here, since these pawns are quite exposed. I believe we have a very nice plan of undermining pawns on h3 and g4 by playing h5 what i especially like about h5 is if they take on h5 
I dig by night and they've just broken their pawn structure. We're absolutely safe. They don't have an attack. Our bishop on g7 is open. King is absolutely safe, not unlike other dragon lines. And we just go with bishop e6 or bishop d7. Usually, when the knight is not on d4, you go with the bishop on e6, not on d7. You place your rook on c8. But usually, when the knight stands on b3, you can also chase it away with a5 and a4. Just like I'm telling you. Here, I'm giving you just lots of ideas, like in general. When the knight is on, not on d4, play bishop on b6. When the knight is on b3, usually, not always, not in every single line, but usually general rules are like play a5 and a4 and chase it away. That's why step-by-step -step videos are good for beginners and good for medium level um, and medium class players to actually get the basics uh, of the middle games and this opening variations. If g5, you just bring it back. And what do you want? Here, you have quite a big number of ideas. It's very interesting that in many of these lines, you would like to sack this bishop. You know how much we like the dragon bishop because of the bishop of g7. But in many of these lines, you just want to give it up for the knight on c3. Then to push your pawn to e5, to isolate the weakness on g5. Or at the same time, to lock the light square bishop on g2 and play uh, against pretty restricted knight on b3. That's a very nice idea. So bishop c3 followed by e5. And only in this variation. It never happens again. And you know what? In maybe 1% of the dragon lines, we're going to give up the dark square bishop. And certainly, this is one of these cases. Okay, so... Let's go, instead of bishop g2 and knight b3, what happens if they play knight d on e2? It's a fairly logical move. It avoids knight e4. And they just want to reroute the knight. First of all, they want to avoid like simplification by knight e4. They want to play bishop g2 castles. And then they will see, do they need the knight on g3, f4? Uh, maybe they just want to overprotect the knight on c3 by knight d on e2. And that's the way it is. Although, if this happens... You just have a beautiful move to launch an initiative. It's a novelty. For example, it's never been played. Never. So it's my novelty. It's b5. And b5 is a great move. It's a great uh, pawn sack. Of course, if you don't feel like playing for novelties, you can play castle, bishop, g2, and rook b8, followed by b5. It's an interesting but quite typical dragon idea. Uh, looks like many similar plans when white plays g3 against the dragon. Black's plan is quite simple. Uh, want to play rook b8, b5, b4. Afterwards, to play e6, queen e7, bishop b7, with absolute flexibility in your game. Apart from this, for example, you in this position uh, can go with, uh, for example, instead of castles. So I showed you castle, rook b8, and b5. I'm, go I'm about to show you my novelty with b5 straight away. But you also can play, for example, move like b6. Like a general rule against the fianchetto positions is whenever they want to play bishop g2, you want to oppose with the b6 and bishop b7. That's the way it is, and that's absolutely a lovely line and easy for playing with the black piece. It scores well in practice. Although I like to suck pawns, dragon opening is full of tactics, and it's an open call for initiative by black, so we're always open to suck something. And after knight b5, you now play h5. And I know how crazy it looks to you. But yeah, we do go with these kinds of things. We're now breaking these pawns, sacking this pawn. And after g takes rook h5, threatening the knight, uh, fixing the weakness on h3. So after knight bc3, bishop d7. You want to play queen c8 going after the h3 pawn. You want to jump with the knight on e5 going on f3 or c4. Or it, at least it stands well on e5. And yes, you want to go rook b8 and going after the long castle if that happens and the b2 pawn is a weakness in their camp. A very lovely game. And finally, those who play bishop e3, which in my opinion after g4 is absolutely the best, you have so many moves. For example, you can play typical plan. Bishop d7, bishop g2, rook c8, queen d2, and queen a5. This happened in a game... Dominguez against Gashimov, Moscow, 2009. An idea uh, by White is to 
uh, face any knight d5 with b3. And that's exactly the point of queen a5. Now you won't be able to play b3 because in many of these lines, knight on c3 is going to be hanging. So that's why this guy plays knight b3, queen c7, f4, and Gashimov played knight a5. He now wants to jump knight c4. A golden rule of the dragon positions is once you grab the dark square bishop in white's game, black is already uh, at least slightly better. So after knight a5, queen a5, you threaten to take on c3, bishop d4, he played uh, e5 actually, he played rook c4, threatening to take on e4 and to take that bishop on d4. Black absolutely, absolutely had a lovely game in this position and he won Chile, he won the game. But that's a typical way, bishop d7, rook c8, knight a5. There is a modern way of uh, breaking in the center with this d5. I'm, that's just an option. There is a very popular way of breaking on the king side by playing h5, bringing the knight to d7, playing knight b6, bishop d7, and rook c8 with the knight on b6. Yes, you did a lot when you played h5 and you forced them to play g5 because they've just made the battery. But keep in mind, this battery can no longer go to h6. That's a big uh, defect for white players, and I believe that they suffer a lot when they cannot attack throughout the age file or by uh, breaking on the king's side uh, and going with the bishop h6. And finally, uh, there is the fourth uh, type of way, playing castles. They just go queen d2 or bishop g2, and when that happens, you just go with d5. That's why some players say, okay, I don't want to play queen d2 early in long castle because d5 solves the problem by black. And that's why, because for example, uh, long castles you take on e4 and boom, bishop e5, knight e4, and queen g5. Lovely game uh, for black, absolutely, absolutely fine. Or in case of knight c6, b takes this one, knight e7 threatening the pawn, they defend it, and you play e6 over protecting d5, so you can go next move with c5. We have a, a pretty a strong pawn chain in the center. Uh, I would like to play c5 and afterwards fork with d4. b file is open, so long castle is going to be pretty weak because of potentially weak b2 square and rook b8, rook b2, queen a5, and so on. So black is doing great in this situation. And finally, those who say, okay, I know for the d5 move, so I'm going to go with the bishop g2, and I won't let him go with d5. By now, you know lots of plans. You know the plan with bishop d7, rook c8, and so on. Uh, but there is also uh, a plan like so, like bishop d7, uh, rook c8, queen d2, and knight e5. But the problem of this plan is that they will play this b3, avoid knight c4, and then they can go with f4 and get quite a nice game. And moment when they, you think that with queen a5, you might solve all the problems, they just go with knight d2. That's how I won that game with the white pieces when I played once this line. My opponent underestimated my uh, h3 and g4 opportunities, and then I went for f4, afterwards a3, b4, rook a d1, knight d5, and I won that game in a nice style. That's why, in my opinion, uh, you'll never make mistake if you play bishop d7, rook c8, and knight e5. But that's exactly what I teach my students. Side lines against the dragon requires a pretty specific approach. If you always go for general bishop d7, rook c8, and knight e5, you might be suffering. Because of that, uh, I suggest something else. Taking on d4 in order to bring the bishop on e6 can also be a pretty classic uh, approach by black. Then third classic approach is a6 uh, to go with knight d4 and at some point when you move the bishop or and you play bishop d7, b5. Then uh, fourth approach could be flexibility. Flexibility with e6. e6 and after this play d5. What I don't like about this plan is I usually like flexibility to go now a6, queen, e7, rook, d8, but I don't like d5 because after this, this taking by knight, somehow, yes, I open up my bishop, but at the same time, I got to suffer because of an IQP on d5. And my job as your coach is just to teach you all these opportunities and lines 
to share my thoughts uh, with you and then you're going to decide whether you like it or not after bishop g2 um, in this whole concept with h3 and g4 somehow i find the h5 move one of the most important things that's what i like that's what i find entertaining for playing with black and we can now get like a general rule this uh, crazy coach Maya told us okay if they go with h3 and g4 you always can consider generally h5 at some point h5 slows down the attack breaks the pawn structure and forces them to commit themselves any g takes h5 you play knight h5 and now they have problems with the attack I analyzed bishop f3 and for example I analyzed knight f6 h4 knight e5 they don't uh, threatening the light square bishop controlling the g4 controlling indirectly h5 as well after bishop e2 you have no reasons to wait uh, i mean they're about to play h5 and i don't know here and there to come up with some sort of action but here you just go with breaking the center old good rule of nimzovich whoever goes in the wing you should break in the center that's one thing and another thing is after knight h5 queen d2 a very lovely trick with the knight f4 if you take on f4 i'm going to take on d4 whether by knight or by bishop if you go with something else i'm just threatening after knight f4 your bishop here on g2 so these are possibilities that i like the most and those who play queen d2 you just break d5 and i just explained you those are nice variations against h3 and g4 and oh it's time to check uh, absolutely the most popular things here it's h3 bishop g7 they go with bishop c4 this h3 and bishop c4 followed by short castle at some point is considered to be one of the most i would say positional boring approaches by white against the dragon so you play castles of course and they play castle and there we go after castles we just have to discuss what's happening here any castle with the bishop on c4 you can face with knight e4 anytime you see that the bishop on c4 stands there you can take on e4 and equalize on the spot with this you're equalizing on spot with this somebody asked me my what if this because if you take the bishop to exchange the queens and knight seven then you play e6 uh, whatever else they do uh, you're just fine so any uh, anything like this you're just fine that's why good players who play this line will never will never play after castle um, and they will they, they won't play castle but they will play bishop to b3 and when they play bishop to b3 you play knight c6 and watch this out you don't have to play knight c6 for example you can play knight a6 that's an interesting idea going with the knight on c5 harassing the light square bishop interesting idea you can play a6 followed by b5 doing for the and going for the double fianchetto where the knight ends up on d7 and you get like full flexibility with the double fianchetto and these flexible knights on f6 and d7 then there is a line where instead of playing a6 you play b6 bishop b7 and knight bd7 playing rook c8 afterwards i like this one and by the way for the first time in the dragon we're about to consider an exchange sack with rook takes c3 followed by knight e4 and i always teach my students any time you can sack on c3 and grab the pawn on e4 do it any time you can sack on c3 uh, and simply they have a long castle but that's going to be the subject of the next lesson but i just want to bring it up here you're just doing it and you're just creating a weak pawns around the king on c1 or b1 in this case obviously we threaten to play rook c3 followed by knight e4 but we also want to play rook c5 threatening the bishop on g5 queen a8 uh, going for a beautiful uh, diagonal a8 h1 for the queen and finally rook fc8 doubling these rooks on the c file a very lovely plan i applied it in few games for sure in the past and usually my experiences were very very fine and finally 
after bishop b3, you can just play knight c6. Uh, that's the main move and that's the best move. Here, they can take on c6 and lots of passers actually like to do it. All you have to remember, you just play a5. When I was preparing for this uh, lecture, I wanted to tell you uh, and I reminded myself of one plan. Any time they take on c6 with the bishop on b3, and it's a very common thing in bullet uh, by those who don't know theory, by those who want to confuse you by playing something hyper solid and logical, but nothing that special in terms of theory. You just go with um, a5, 97, 95, harassing the light square bishop, threatening a4. They cannot play a3 or a4 because then you take on b3 and they gotta take by c pawn, or uh, then you play work b8, bishop a6, and so on. A very lovely plan. Those who play castle, we have one of the most critical variations there. And uh, those who play castle, you usually can treat it the following way. You just take it, bring the knight back to d7 to threaten the queen, and go with the knight c5 after the bishop. A very lovely plan. You've just opened up the bishop on g7. It's open, it's good. Knight on c5 is kind of harassing the light square bishop and you're just doing fine with black. On top of all this, uh, I just have to show you another type of move. So, order of move. Imagine they go with the bishop e3. We once again can reach similar type of the games. And it's very important to understand that in this lecture, we won't talk about bishop e3. But here, I'm just talking about the bishop e3 as a part of the h3 bishop c4 plan. So you play bishop g7, of course. They go h3, you go knight c6, they go bishop c4, and you go castles. And take a look at this one. If they go for a castle, a golden rule, for example, in previous position, uh, we haven't seen exactly the same type of game we've seen without a bishop on b e3, and when they brought a bishop back to b3. Then you play knight e4, knight e7, knight c5. But here, you have this lovely idea of uh, Shirov and other guys, 94. Any 94, you're just equalizing with d5. They gotta go like this. They gotta go like this. You take, take, and just play queen c7. Position is absolutely fine. But this is not more. And, uh, and uh, it's absolutely not for draw, but not for more than that. After c3, rook b8, queen e2, bishop e6, and black is fine. And finally, in case of uh, castles and instead of castle uh, 94 good players will here play bishop to b3 those who do it here i just have to explain you how to fight now you would say but maya now we can't play 94 you just told us that uh, we cannot play or we should not play bishop d7 rook c8 always you always can do it but it's never going to be the best simply simply saying Certain continuations require certain uh, reactions by black. Uh, to take on d4, bishop d4 and play bishop e6 makes no sense because the bishop is on b3. And you can go and harass this bishop with knight g4. That's the point of h3. So what are we going to do? Well, since we really consider the light square bishop on b3 being one of the best pieces in white's game, you just go with knight a5. Uh, knight a5 clearly shows you your intentions. No, it's not always to take on b3. For the time being, it's going to be standing there on a5. Sometimes you can even go with b6, bishop a6. Sometimes b6, bishop e7. Sometimes bishop d7, rook c8, knight c4. Sometimes a6, b5. But sometimes you just want to take that bishop. So it's kind of flexible, a very nice idea that goes after the light square bishop. So after castle, you now have so many options. But believe it or not, the worst probably would be to take on b3. I'm not saying it, it, it would be the uh, it would be bad one. I'm just saying com in comparison to a6 or b6, it would be the worst one. So let's go. Uh, when I spoke to GM Ivanishevich uh, from Serbia, he told me uh, for a very nice an interesting plan with a6. An idea is to play b5. I already won a couple of games with this plan. a6, idea is b5. And when they go with like f4, they just want to break very fast without any hesitation here with e5. And now a very lovely plan, 
knight takes b3. Now you're saying, okay, you've just taken on b3. You've just taken the bishop here. But you lack space, man. What are you going to do now? And I was very happy when he taught me and when he showed me this idea b5. Point of this move is if they take on b5, you play bishop b7 and go after both. So you can't take here because your rook would be hanging. So you cannot take, but we won't take. We go for this intermediary move, threaten now both uh, pawn on e4 and knight on b5, and you're just doing fine. So I played a couple of games like this and won all my games because eventually I end up in an open game with a bishop pair. Another thing is between uh, Grandmaster uh, Popov and Ivanishich. For example, bishop b7. This guy played b4 to stop b4 by black. Rook c8, c file is his, and after knight b3, played a very lovely knight h5. Knight a5, bishop a8, bishop d4, took on f4, took on d4, and played e5, and this guy resigned the game. So just like you see, okay, I mean, they continue to play a little bit more and white resign. Then uh, they go with e5. e5 happened between me and uh, young Fide Master from Serbia. I captured and jumped knight e5. And for some reason, they all think that they tricked me here. They take and play knight f5. And it looks interesting because for the time being, or, or at least uh, right now, it looks like they're about to win the queen or the pawn on e7. I always play queen e4, threatening the bishop. They always give me check. Uh, but they actually give me knight e7 check. After knight e7, king h8, now they have problems. They have problems with the bishop, with the pawn, with the potentially stuck knight on e7. That's why knight h6 I analyzed, bishop b7 threatening mate on g2, and when they go with uh, rook f2, you just go rook f to d8. Black is absolutely fine, and this is what happened uh, in game between GM uh, Petar Popovic and Velimirovic, legendary Yugoslavian uh, GM, who was actually uh, a great dragon expert. Apart from uh, this idea with knight a5 and a6 taking on b3 and playing b5 I want to show you another plan favorite Kremnik's idea how did Kremnik play the dragon he never played the dragon itself but for example Kremnik was known for rouser system but when he plays knight c6 and no matter which side move they tried against him such as bishop e2 he transposes into the dragon such as B bishop e3 uh, okay he, he would play knight g4 but when they play like g3 he transposes into the dragon uh, when they play like f4 transposing into the dragon uh, what does it show you it actually shows you that he absolutely had a great belief in the dragon side the dragon positions for black so after like h3 bishop g7 bishop c4 castles they go bishop b3 you go knight c6 and if they go castles you go knight d4 and that's why i told you if they want to play what i just showed you they have to play sixth move bishop e3 seventh move h3 eighth move bishop c4 and now if castle knight e4 sorry if castle knight e4 i apologize but in case of bishop b3 you just go knight a5 just like i said we would like to grab that bishop at some point and to go either for a6 or b6. We've seen idea with a6, knight b3, and b5, let's, which is a very refreshing and nice one for black. But let's see the idea with b6. That's Kramnik's favorite plan. Your light square bishop goes on b7 or a6, and you would like to go with a rook c8. At the same time, if you take on b3, they will recapture by a pawn, then you won't be able to play bishop a6, but you go rook b7, bishop b7, rook c8, you go after the pawn on e4, and that's a fairly nice position. After b6, uh, for example, let's take a look at rook e1. Bishop b7, bishop g5, take, take. For example, I'm going to find you Kasparov's game here. Take a look at this one. Kasparov was a big fan of dragon games. Um, he was absolutely phenomenal with the dragon with the black pieces uh, like back to 90s and here uh, he was enjoying like the double fianchetto and uh, kind of a flexible position here i'm very happy 
with the following plan uh, with h6 and queen d7 last move played by Kasparov uh, shows that he wants to equalize easily the point of this move is to avoid after knight d5 and knight d5 is usually the most critical idea by white you absolutely can take and now when they think oh my goodness we're threatening to take on uh, e7 no you won't be able to do it that's why we uh, rushed with h6 and that's why we made that intermediary move imagine the bishop was on g5 you wouldn't have g5 now so that's why you play h6 now you play g5 to get rid of that threat now they can jump knight f5 so that's why you can absolutely easily take on b5 that's the point of the queen d7 in these positions and that's why knight d5 and the whole approach based with the knight d5 doesn't seem to be working so after working one bishop b7 bishop g5 knight b3 h6 queen d7 this guy played f3 Casper played rook f to d8 play d5 f knight f6 knight f6 knight b5 played bishop g5 played a6 and b5 and just like you see uh Kasparov played fairly nice game but afterwards they just drew the game so and this was another interesting example then instead of rook e1 after b6 for example imagine they go f4 looks like they are about to break it with e5 now you gotta take it before they break it with e5 and do e6 you gotta take here play bishop b7 double fianchetto and they go queen d3 what's the easiest plan to go a6 to go b5 to go rook c8 97 95 if needed even e5 if needed and black should be absolutely fine i believe that we covered in details this h3 lines so it's time for bishop g5 before that let me just grab a glass of water what about bishop g5 bishop g5 is nothing that's special but it's extremely common in practice in bullet and blitz i keep facing this move very often and you just have to go with bishop g7 and now they have two type of moves they have the line that used to be popular like 40 years ago with bishop e5 and they have a typical uh, bullet blitz approach queen d2 let's go first with queen d2 because it's considered to be definitely weaker than bishop e5 which is considered to be better so queen d2 on queen d2 uh, I don't like to do, go for short castle simply I don't like to do it because they can play very primitive bishop h6 trade the dark square bishops off and somehow I don't see how can we reach any kind of uh, typical dragon attack without a dark square bishop and do you know what what do I uh, pull out here sometimes uh, I'm so depressed that they're about to exchange the dark square bishop that I rather sack my rook and play down an exchange and keeping the dark square bishop while they don't have it imagine and be absolutely uh, sure that engines are going to give white here advantage but it's not a huge advantage and from humans point of view uh, I would say position can be considered with certain amount of compensation for black although in order to avoid these suspicious lines you should go with after queen d2 knight c6 I always like early 96 and it's like a pretty big pain for white players they can play bishop h6 now because we just take queen takes and we take the pawn the piece so they can go for that double x uh, a double question mark for bishop h6 now they say aha uh -huh, that's why he plays 96 so we can play bishop h6. let me take and play bishop h6 i'm not lying to you if I tell you that I played probably 100 games like this I always take and I play kind of refutation queen b6 no one sees what do I want I just want to tell you we're threatening b2 and now you're saying but Maya you also put a yellow color on the f2 square why I mean okay it looks like weak if they make long castle then you're going to take it but I mean why on earth did you do it for example if they play b3 and that's what majority of these guys do almost without thinking Ta -da -da -da. queen f2 take a look at this nice tactics so you go for queen f2 king takes knight g4 
and that's how you get the queen back in general you've just won a pawn broken their pawn structure and you should be winning those who play rook b1 same destiny queen f2 followed by knight g4 that's why most of these guys when they when you play knight c6 take take play bishop h6 and when they realize <coughs> that you play queen b6 they're in severe troubles they're in severe troubles they have uh, so much to fear here and they don't know how to face the queen b6 idea uh, simply saying uh, castle queen f2 b3 queen f2 and if queen c1 you just play rook b8 and you just have an amazing amount of initiative anyways this is why after queen d2 knight c6 they can't play bishop h6 they can't play knight c6 and those who say but let me just play knight c6 and play long castle now can i go for that i'm threatening bishop h6 i am threatening e5 looks dangerous and at first glance looks like they're just doing everything here you have a very lovely rook b8 and rook b8 in cooperation with the bishop on g7 gives you one of the easiest and nicest tactics it's knight to e4 it's knight to e4 and you want to go knight e4 threatening to take on b2 and to win the game on the spot uh, if they play f3 include the queen and uh, after queen a5 you're just involving one more piece into the action afterwards with the bishop e6 if they go e5 which i'd go for and i would say isn't this almost winning for white no it's almost losing for white you play knight e5 and now they can't take on d6 because even rook b2 or queen takes d6 or whatever so when they take take and if they take on d6 you have bishop e2 well at the time of queen d5 you just go short castle what's the point they can't touch it because of bishop e2 from another point of view uh, from another point of view uh, after like castle <coughs> I apologize no matter what I do I'll play bishop e6 queen a5 rook f c8 black is just fantastic all things considered after queen d2 knight c6 lots of guys will avoid bishop h6 and knight c6 and will just play castle after castle you play short castle and once again give them chance to make mistake any knight c6 and anyone who thinks that after taking on c6 and breaking with e5 they can launch some sort of action it's a crazy mistake well, okay i know it looks like pretty convincing and uh, very tempting at first glance but it's not you always jump with the knight on d5 and when they take take any queen d5 you just play bishop e6 followed by bishop e5 and rook b8 any takes d6 you play rook b8 and this move is a big thing i played a couple of uh blitz games where my opponents went for a c3 i captured on d6 and when they play queen d5 i just played beautiful bishop c3 this move wins the game because when they play take on uh, d6 i just first take on b2 and i'm winning when they take on c3 i just give check play bishop g4 and play rook to d8 winning the queen uh, really lovely uh, variations based on lots of tactics and that's why I like the dragon because if you want to play with the white pieces you gotta know your stuff you gotta know what you're doing and that's why coaches really often uh, teach kids to play the dragon with black pieces also you can develop your tactical skills and some of the basic um, you know like strategic ideas such as second exchange on c3 and carry on playing a normal game anyways in this position if knight to b3 that's the main move it scores well in practice but just because black doesn't seem to know the best continuation after uh, bishop e6 or castle do whatever I, I i just propose you to play like uh, castle and when they play long castle uh, just go with the following line so just go with the following line since the knight uh, isn't standing on d4 you can play bishop e6 they go with f3 and here i'm suggesting this fairly simple rook c8 king b1 95 and that's the way it is any bishop h6 as gary casper used to say it's a matter of chess culture never let them sack the rook for the knight on c3 because it gives you a beautiful rook c8 d5 a5 a4 
gives you a great uh, compensation. Well, at the same time, if they go with bishop e2, you go rook e8. Why rook e8? So after bishop h6, you can go bishop h8. No more attack on the rook. But you also can take and do something, I would call it now cultural, uh, rook takes e3, b takes e3, and queen c7 with a nice uh, compensation. Maybe at this moment, you would say, but what the hell is this? This guy just sacrificed an exchange for what? Well, for broken pawns around the king, since the king is on b1. Well, for uh, a5 and a4. Well, for some d5 ideas. For some rook c8 ideas afterwards. And so many other things. But as long as the queens are on the board with a pawn structure like this, and the king stands on b1, I can say that the black at, at least has very decent compensation. You know, let's go for one of the main variations after bishop g5 bishop g7 bishop b5 i don't know uh, the name of the bishop g5 and the bishop b5 line i just remember that i played it i don't know i played maybe three or four times my blitz games i always won because i knew this line uh, from when i was like really a kid i learned some ideas and ever since then i keep beating up these guys you just uh, play knight bd7 or bishop d7 I believe both are fine. I like bishop d7. But knight bd7 was played in game even Chugashimo. So after knight bd7, queen e2, an idea is long castle, f4, and d5. And it looks it really looks scary unless you know the main idea. So castles, long castles, a6, bishop d7, bishop d7, f4. And just when you think like, oof, it's something wrong about my game because e5 is unstoppable, you do a thing uh, that comes... Uh, when it comes to talk about culture in chess. Rook c8 to sack for the knight on c3. So what's the point? If they go e5, you boom, you do it. You cannot even imagine how many times I won my games. Uh, this is Ivanchuk Gashimov. Ivanchuk captured. Gashimov played knight e5, threatening on c3. When Ivanchuk defended it, uh, this guy played queen a5, won the pawn on c3, and eventually... Uh, killed Ivanchuk in a razor attack. You can analyze this at home. But another thing is after rook c3, lots of guys against me first took on f6. I captured my opponent, I'm now running your bishop. When you take on c3 and I take on g5, turns out that with a bishop pair, broken pawn structure, and the pawn and the bishop for the rook in general, black is much better. This is almost technically winning for black. You place the rook on c8, queen on a5, and you're just so much better. So all these broken pawns don't seem to be uh, good uh, defense uh, for trust for the king on b1. Then I gotta show you what happens if they play 11 fish variation f4. It's one of the most difficult and trickiest variations. You can even find on my channel video that I, uh, where I covered this for white. One of the most dangerous lines and 77% of the wins for white with f4. Why? Because usually you pre move bishop g7 or you simply don't know how to face bishop g7. So after f4, you just go with knight c6. There are only two moves where you first play knight c6 instead of doing something else. So you do f4, knight c6. Take a look at this one. Instead of uh, doing uh, knight c6, lots of guys do bishop g7. If you want to find like tricks about these positions, uh, find my video on my channel. It's called, I don't know, not Levin Fish Variation. I didn't call it and I didn't give that title, but something against the dragon for white. And here, if it ever happens to you, and if you make mistake by bishop g7, there is only one move that you have to do. It's knight h5. It's absolutely logical, and that's why most of guys with the black pieces keep losing their games. Most of these guys capture, and when you go with like knight h5, they now give you check, and you now you realize you cannot come like this. You don't want to play bishop d7 because of e6, uh, or g4 to trap the knight. And when you play knight d7, g4 trapping the knight on h5. So when they go like this, they just go knight e6 and win the queen. Watch out not to be a victim of something like this. So you just go with knight h5 and 
then you are about to learn after bishop b5, bishop d7, e6 line. It looks extremely scary. It might look like, oof, things went very wrong for me. Uh, I'm completely lost. No, you're not. Black is even fine. Why do I know it? Because when I was playing bullet actively, uh, many times playing the dragon, I pre-moved bishop g7. And they're so happy when they have this e5 move. I played knight h5, bishop b5, bishop d7, and I simply had to learn, had to know what's the best way of playing this position. Believe it or not, you take, and when they play knight e6, you now first take on c3, so you're not going to have like a hanging bishop. And now you play queen c8. And here you're threatening to take on b5 and e6. They gotta take. You don't take by queen, but you take by king, threatening the knight and the pawn. And when they go like this, you go with this, and it's just a normal game. But if you ask me, I prefer this playing with the black pieces. There is something for white where they can force the draw, but just like I showed you, there is no reason to panic if you play bishop g7. Although, on f411 fish variation, you should be going with knight c6. And here, uh, they have two plans. They have a plan of taking on c6 and breaking e5, or playing an extremely annoying plan against the dragon that reminds me of the GPA setup used in the past by Yudit Polgar, Ilya Smirin, Johnny Hector, a GM, attractive GM from Sweden, who likes lots of tactical positions and games. And Yudit, I remember when she beat Topola with this knight f3, and at that time, f4 and knight f3 looked to me like extremely dubious approach to go for a win. But playing knight f3 is very annoying. Uh, they're not allowing any simplification with knight e4 and supporting e5. When you play bishop g7, they just play bishop b3. Castles, castles. And now, no matter what you do, they just want to go with queen e1, f5, queen h4, bishop h6, and knight g5. So if you ever wondered what can be an interesting plan, an IDF against the dragon, this is one of the very interesting moves. And I certainly can tell you, go for the 11 fish variation against the dragon and try out your luck because lots of club players won't know, unless they check this video, how to play with the black pieces. And since you're watching this video and you're checking what should you do, let me just tell you what should you do here. The key moment and the key move is b5. Key moment is now and the key move is b5. What's so special about this b5? Well, when you play b5, you're just playing uh, and relying on following things. If they take by knight, you play queen b6 and take queen e4. You get a pawn back with a pretty, pretty big, you know, like interest. If they take by bishop, you go queen b6 check and take on e4. Once again, you got a pawn back with a pretty big interest. What happens if in these situations they simply don't seem to do anything? And since you're threatening b4, a5 and bishop a6, that's our plan, they just go for a3. Uh, lots of guys did it against me and turns out that b4 knight b4 knight e3 doesn't seem to help us. It's the best to go for the double fianchero, a6, double fianchero, and now looks like they have a typical GPA type of the game as well. Don't worry about that. It's not like that. You just play e6 maximum flexibility. They go for f5, and you just play e takes f5. Now you want to go with the knight on e5. If they take, you just go with knight e5, and you open up the bishop on this diagonal. That's why our position looks so nice. If they go bishop h6, you take it, knight g4, and then you go queen b6, and you're even winning the game. The thing is, the thing is, after b5, they gotta go queen e1. So they carry on with a typical GPA type of attack. You play b4, and I played so many games. I'm not afraid of knight e5. I always play queen a5. It's a little bit surprising, it's, but it's the top move, because now we threaten to take on d5, and they can't keep the tension on the board. They gotta take on f6 or they gotta defend the knight. Otherwise, we're gonna win it. So it, queen a5 is a beautiful move. If they move it back, for example, knight to d1, and most of the guys who play this line play like this against me. I play a5 to go with bishop a6. They go 
for example king h1 or and then we just go with bishop a6 they take we take um it's a nice position for black uh, they can't move now queen all the way up to h4 because e4 is hanging and already position is very dubious for them if they do it anyways and they don't care then we take on d3 and we go after the possibly weak pawn with queen b6 or queen b8 queen b6 or queen b8 it's the point that whether we do one or another we just want to go with the queen b5 going after the pawn on d3 and when you know these type of ideas your positions are always going to look absolutely fine they all take and play e5 i just want to uh, tell you one thing lots of guys uh, you always go back with the knight on d7 lots of guys here strictly for tactical and tricky purposes go for bishop c4 no you can't play d5 but you know what sometimes you you're simply i don't know out of your mind uh, you're tired you forgot it simply and you play d5 and they do it because they have this and it looks like they're winning guys even if that happens don't go into some sort of depression take it looks like they're going to meet you and attack the rook you play queen b6 now they don't have mate if they take on f7 and we already won a piece so they gotta take the rook when they take the rook you play queen before check and take the bishop in my opinion position is relatively unclear and with a bishop pair with two pieces for the rook okay we do have problems to complete development but i kind of like this position for black uh if bishop c4 you always should go with bishop g7 they take and go knight b6 bishop b3 and castles i won a few games like this point is if they try to win and to keep the pawn up and take on e7 uh, i go queen e7 queen e2 and they all think that i don't have a critical move but i do have it it's queen h4 and they're lost so when they go with g3 you just go back with the queen on h3 you want to play bishop g4 you want to go with a rook e8 bishop is open king is absolutely demolished they cannot even go into the castle and they are just lost we've seen what to do against bishop c4 how to play against e takes e takes um, i always use some sort of uh, interesting or specific explanations about some uh, variations so you can uh, easier get to know these variations so you can easier uh, have an experience with this type of the lines in this case after e takes e takes this is the only position in the whole dragon experience where your dark square bishop doesn't go on g7 but it goes on e7 that's how you learn aha uh -huh, he went for the 11 fish aha uh -huh, okay so maya told us not to go with the bishop on g7 but with the bishop on e7 and my um, uh, friend and the student and the football star Jovelic played recently somewhere and he asked me Mile, uh, th this was the position where the bishop goes on e7 i said yes aha uh -huh, okay 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 so that's how you play and why why for example when they go bishop e3 uh, for example if they go queen d4 you just go knight f6 and still bishop e3 or bishop goes on e7 don't forget about that but if they go with bishop e3 your bishop goes uh, on e7 so they cannot take on d6 and when they go queen d2 castle short long castle you play d5 absolutely the easiest type of position i just want to play rook b8 and queen a5 and for example i was just talking to jovelic then and we were reviewing some lines in the european blitz and rapid and he asked me something and i told him and here you just go queen a5 for example they go g4 you go rook b8 and when they play f5 critical idea here is da -da -da -da, queen a3 what a beautiful move you're threatening mate they can't take it because of checkmate with the bishop a3 if they do something else such as knight b5 you can just take on a2 and you're winning if they for example play bishop b5 you just play rook b5 and when they play knight b5 uh, all the remains all the the threats remain the same knight c3 queen a1 knight b1 after bishop a6 rook b8 black is the one who holds a very huge initiative with the bishop pair with the bishop and the pawn for the piece 
they have problems with the king undeveloped and uh, pretty much disharmony in about their pieces so black is doing great of course that here you can play bishop a3 and win but somehow this queen a3 they're going to fall off the chair when they face it okay uh, that's all about the leaven fish radiation and it's time for the next one next one is fianchetto and fianchetto g3 uh, there are two approaches here i will tell you all together with leaven fish radiation where you always go with knight c6 uh, this is the second variation where we should go for knight c6 instead of bishop g7 so here you go with the knight c6 as well what's wrong with bishop g7 well let's be honest nothing special and nothing that wrong but after bishop g2 castles castles knight c6 they can take push e5 trade the queens off and then you're forced to play this boring end game to be honest with you my experience in the past wasn't that positive because they have three against one my bishop is closed uh, I have somehow problems to I don't know like connect all my pieces put them in some sort of harmony and to start to push them that's why I believe uh, it's pretty annoying for playing or at least objectively speaking it's equal I don't want to play those kinds of things and I'm playing the dragon I want some fire on the board right so because of that you should be going for 96 and once again we gotta get back to the beginning of the lesson when I explained you h3 and g4 approaches and when I told you you first play knight c6 because you won them they have two moves bishop g2 and knight d on e2 so when they go with for example bishop g2 you take on d4 and when they go knight d on e2 they don't allow you to take on d4 these two moves are possible I just want to show you one more line that became very popular and played by Vitugov and Ragyar, even Van Hal once in the game. It's knight takes e6 and bishop g2. Uh, looks like a very primitive approach, e5 to take on c6. All you have to do queen c7. And when they play like b3, that's what Vitugov played, bishop g7, bishop b2, castles, castles. A critical move here, novelty, and no one ever did it is h5. You, there is no knight on the king's side so you're going with this crazy engine popular moves but now nowadays all these crazy moves that I used to play in normal circumstances by myself that people called me you always play h4 you always play h5 you're crazy now engines like it so much so uh, this is h5 followed by h4 and you're just doing fine in case of knight c6 b takes c6 there is one more tricky line played by karklinch that's a, a gm from uh, latvia used to play this a e5 and after d takes queen d8 and he used to play this kind of an end game we have position which have been uh, which has been appeared many times in practice of grandmaster karklinch with quite good results for him but i put this position on board and uh, to be honest with you i I was blitzing it out with a good friend of mine, uh, I am and GM, and uh, I mean, good friends of mine. And uh, the thing is, I didn't have particular problems. All you have to know is that the king goes on c7, and when they go with castles, you gotta know for the move rook b8. What's the point of rook b8? Uh, you're not allowing this bishop to develop that easy. And there is another thing you wanna go with the knight d7 bishop g7 and if needed f6 if possible f5 and d4 that's all you have to remember and your game is fine just remember after rookie one you go back with the knight on d7 and go either f6 or f5 if they allow us uh, because of that after uh, knight c6 they go mainly for two moves bishop g2 or knight on e2 those who play bishop g2 i believe we're almost equalizing on the spot we take on d4 and play bishop g7 here there are so many options uh grandmaster onishchuk from ukraine has fantastic results with e5 i analyzed these positions and realized that after knight d7 queen we pin the knight and the queen they pin the knight and the king we go castles it's very interesting not to take by bishop because they have this fancy 
bishop h6 move and then you cannot castle and you have lots of problems with the king uh, getting stuck in the center so after castles they take you play knight b6 and position is okay for us if they go queen f4 you just take on d6 play bishop e6 with a fairly simple game for black after knight e4 d5 bishop f5 and queen e7 so just like you see even though we end up uh, with an IQP isolated queen pawn uh, we actually need to play aggressively to get rid of it or to fight with an IQP type of the game so you play rook f to e8 knight c4 play rook a d8 so we once again get back to the old good rule when you play with IQP go for type of active game and another thing is in case of queen h4 instead of queen f4 you take an honest to play bishop g5 but in that game, his opponent didn't go for bishop c3, rook e8, and queen c7, where he threatens queen c4, queen c4 exchanging the queens. He threatens the pawn on c3. Uh, so if bishop f6, you go queen c4. If something else, you take on c3, and black is fine. Those are concrete lines, and that's what you have to know. For example, when uh, Grandmaster Petar Popovic from Serbia a master of this fianchetta against the dragon used to play a4 it's one of the best move uh, excluding ninth move short castle so castle short and ninth, ninth move a4 are the best moves for white the point of this move is to simply avoid any kind of p5 at any point and to get some space so when you play castle they just go with a queen before i remember when i faced it over the board i had lots of problems like ooh, i can't move the lights for a bishop can they take on b7 or what are they going to do and this move scores extremely well in the practice for white here you just go with a5 which is a beautiful move and whether they go with the queen b3 or a queen b5 you just go with the knight d7 in both of these cases i even believe it's better when the queen comes to b3 and that's what majority of players did in the practice no one ever played knight d7 you open up the bishop on g7 you want to harass the queen with knight c5 and on top of all that want to play b6 bishop a6 that's how you treat this a4 move finally if they go castles you go castles and there we go um once again they can play queen before famous from the game mike Adams against kremnik after adams played queen b3 kremnik played bishop e6 i remember playing against and black is fine I remember playing against Grandmaster Juric, who in Serbian league once against me played queen b5. I played bishop e6, and afterwards I played rook c8. I played something, and I eventually managed to uh, beat him up. Just like you see, in all these positions were fine. Usually they like to go with h3, and when we go bishop e6, threatening knight d5, because when they move the queen, we take by knight on c3 and create so many. Uh, troublesome pawns on c2 c3 and a2 they gotta go with the queen on d1 in two title tuesdays i won my games with the queen c8 uh attacking the pawn on h3 and threatening bishop c4 to win an exchange that's very interesting two title tuesdays in a row i played twice games with the queen c8 and won my games like this that's why they gotta play queen d1 and here i'd go with a game um, Makarichev GM from Russia against Svidler when Svidler played queen c8 threatening the pawn this guy played queen h2 and now Makarichev brought his queen onto the c4 he wants to support the idea of going after the c file and the knight on c3 with b5 and b4 and black was doing great and just like you see uh, I keep giving you all these if early queen d3 you play bishop e6 now h3 queen c8 would just transpose into the line that i showed you so they gotta go knight d5 that's the typical approach that's what good players do okay not a big deal we play rook c8 they go c3 and we play rook e8 for the first time in our uh, dragon a lesson and practice we're seeing this move usually you play rook e8 when you want to avoid battery bishop h6 so you cannot exchange and you can keep the dark square bishop it's fine but here you actually do rook e8 for other reasons what's the reason you just want to keep an eye on the e7 pawn 
you want to move your queen away at some point so rook on e8 keeps the knight and defends the pawn on e7 so after rook e8 they go h3 stopping knight g4 if they play bishop e3 you play queen d7 at first sight it seems that black simply wants to attack the pawn on h3 but the major idea is to put the queen on a4 so after king h2 queen a4 and now you see the point now they don't have 97 now this rook is defending the pawn on e7 so many times when you don't know what to do you won't make mistake if you play rook e8 bishop g5 now you gotta you can't keep the tension uh because they gotta they want to take and to break our pawns so we take play bishop f5 take on d1 and play fairly normal game it's a classical position uh, but i absolutely absolutely uh, find that this position is a little bit better for black because of these uh, monstrously strong uh, two bishops this one is fine but this one is not so black has to be better uh, now we have to go for the line where after g3 they go with the main move after knight c6 it's knight d on e2 here i just want to give you a few plan approaches uh, there are in my opinion four different but good plans for black against knight on e2 by the way knight on e2 is the most solid approach against the dragon and you have four different approaches the most i would say convincing one lately and the, the, the efficient one and the score is the best for black is b6 you just go for the double for the fianchero so bishop g2 you oppose the bishop with bishop here they go castles you do it bishop g7 any h3 to secure bishop uh, e3 with the knight g4 you just play like this and here maybe you don't have that but you can play rook c8 rook e8 you can play like a whole bunch of moves you can play e6 queen e7 your position is absolutely fine another plan apart from this b6 which is absolutely absolutely uh, finance scores really well in the practice is a typical plan in these positions it's uh we go bishop g7 bishop g2 castles castles and now we go for some sort of minority attack you go rook b8 removing your bishop from the pin i mean rook from the pin and you want to simply unleash the b5 and b4 when that happens here they just have to go with a4 to stop it and you go with a6 and now when you play a6 you want to go with b5 they have h3 or knight d5 no matter who are you going to play they will all go like h3 or knight d5 you play b5 yourself and this is how you're gonna have like lots of games this is also a very nice game normal position for black you shouldn't have any special problems and finally uh if you like something really interesting we've seen b6 we've seen uh bishop g7 castle and rook b8 but if you like something interesting then you can go with h5 you know that i like these crazy approaches bishop uh, h3 bishop d7 bishop g2 queen c8 you're not allowing them to make short castle they gotta do double fianchetto and then you play bishop g7 bishop b2 h4 g4 and knight sack like this I played most of my games like this. It's known from the game Sergei Movsesian against Likovsky, played in Czech Republic back to 2007. Uh, even though this position looks great for Black uh, Movsesian, who's a great chess player and has an amazing chess skills, managed to win this with White. But Black is definitely fine. Although this is a little bit crazy approach, if you ask me. You should rather go with b6 double fianchetto and to oppose the bishop of g2 or go with the bishop g7 short castle and rook b8 with a typical minority attack against these systems all things considered when we now complete the story about the sidelines there were so many lines that i had to cover in this lecture for you hopefully and once again i didn't go too deep into these lines i just gave you the ideas i just tried to put you in the right direction many times i would just tell you what should be the move that you should be analyzing and looking and believe me with the 30 years of dragon experience and coaching so many good players 
I believe that I know what I'm saying and what I'm doing here if I tell you that uh, play this move instead of that move so uh, hopefully you will find this video entertaining you will find it good uh, for all of you who know nothing about the dragon hopefully after this video you feel like oof even these boring lines don't seem to be that boring and dragon is good imagine what's gonna happen when i start showing you with all these crazy sacrifices and attacks on both sides thanks for watching and see you next time bye bye